We're looking today at Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Jesus walks on water. I love that song that's been written in the last couple of years about oceans deep as it kind of captures the spirit of, of this passage in Mark 6, particularly the Matthew passage that we read earlier, the companion passage. We're going to look at Mark 6, verses 45 to 52. I hope you've got that in your Bibles. If you don't have it, we'll put it up on the screens for you. But if you don't have a Bible, let me know because we want to get you a Bible. We want you to open your Bible. Turn to this passage. If you're not sure where it is, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So the second book in the New Testament, Mark, chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. I would ask you to stand with me, so I'm going to read this English Standard Version. You follow along in your Bibles as I read. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And there are some phrases, some statements in this passage that ought to make us gasp in amazement and in puzzlement. Just how could it be? Let's unpack this today and see what the Lord will have us know about it. Thank you. Be seated. I suppose if there is a phrase that gets used in all sorts of ways by people. It's this idea of walking on water. You've heard them. Well, he must think he can walk on water. Or, well, it's not like he walks on water, does he? It can use, be used pejoratively. It can be used uh, uh, in disbelief. It can be used to uh, in adulation. Man, I bet he could walk on water. But it, it throws it completely out of kilter. It's not, it's not in the context in which it occurs in this passage, these, these companion passages. John has another uh, telling of this in John uh, 6, verses 15 to 21. Luke does not record it, but Matthew, Mark, and John do. And when you lay the three stories side by side, Matthew, Mark, and John, you, you, see, a, you see similarities enough that it should convince us that, <clears throat> that this is true. This is one of those passages, by the way, that people who, who want to discount the Bible sneer at. That one, no one walks on water. How foolish is that? I mean, Jesus didn't, and Peter certainly didn't. And they mock this passage. And then some try to rescue the passage. Rudolf Bultmann, who was a German theologian, a couple of centuries ago, was famous for his, quote, demythologizing scripture. Now you hear that and you know immediately something's not right about that. He would, he would take the passage of the scripture and take out the supernatural, take out the stuff that didn't make sense, you don't have much of a Bible left if you do that, by the way. But he would say a passage like this, that we don't have to get concerned about whether or not Jesus actually walked on the water. But we, we get encouraged to know that he will walk on the troubles of our lives. You, not, you, you, know, you see that, don't you? And while we may draw that as a lesson from that, 
we, the first thing we want to establish is that this is historically true. Our Savior, our sovereign Savior, who had already shown these disciples earlier in the, in the, in the gospel account that he was sovereign over the elements, just caused the, a storm so treacherous that fishermen who made their living on the sea were terrified that they were going to perish in the storm. Jesus simply spoke to it, remember, like a, like a pet dog, peace be still. And the waves calmed and sat down immediately. Well, this experience occurs again with other things happening. John tells us in his gospel in, in chapter 6, verse 15, that, that the reason this episode occurs, one of the reasons is that the people were trying to take him by force and make him king. Remember, because he had fed them. They had fed themselves and were full. Think about that a moment. We pass right over that. Do you have any idea how many times in the life of a person, an average person in Jesus' day, that he would actually be able to eat to the full? As if he'd walked into a buffet? Folks, that doesn't happen very many places in the world today. We're one of the few countries that even know what the word buffet means, or, or at least have taken a word and given it our own meaning. If I say buffet, nearly everyone you just say all you can eat, all you care to eat, whatever. And he had fed this crowd, and they were full, completely full. And so they wanted to make him their bread-serving king by force, and he, he withdrew, John tells us in John 6. Well, let's look at four angles on this passage today. First, that Jesus shows us the necessity of prayerful solitude. Second, he shows us the necessity of ministry engagement. Third, he shows us when he is near, we need not fear Finally, we can learn from Peter's experience as we go, as we take our passage in Mark and we draw in from Matthew the section that Peter chose to leave out when he was dictating to Mark this gospel account. First of all, Jesus shows us the necessity of prayerful solitude. This should strike us. Sometimes we would imagine that we are too busy for prayerful solitude. Sometimes we would imagine that, uh, that silence is overrated. I would submit to you, however, that there was, there's never been a person to walk the earth who, who had a nearness to God like Jesus of Nazareth had. God was his father. He had existed co-eternally with the Father and the Spirit he tells us that he only, he only says what the Father tells him to say. When he was on this earth, uh, in his ministry, he was simply telling what the Father said. To, he simply did what the Father said to do. He only went where the Father told him to go. This man is wired to fellowship with God the Father. And yet he found it necessary. And you can go through the gospel accounts, take your four gospel accounts, do a search of prayer, and find out where Jesus drew aside. He drew aside. So what happens in this passage is he sends the disciples on across the lake, the sea. And then he draws aside. He disperses the crowd. Then he goes up on the mountain to pray alone. He shows us the necessity of prayerful solitude. We're a society... That if, if someone from, from another planet looked upon us, we're a society that folks would, can conclude that we, we fear silence. There's always sounds going on. Music, news, entertainment. And you'll read from time to time someone who has made a commitment to, quote, unplug. They're going to unplug from their from their uh, smartphone, unplug from their tablet, unplug from the TV, unplug even from the phone. They're going to unplug and detox. And when you follow these folks, if you've read, you've read much about them, you know that when they come on the other side of the, when they, when they break that fast and they go back to some of these things, 
There's a certain cleansing that comes, a certain renewing, a certain clarity. So folks, mark it down. If our lives are too busy to factor in times of prayerful solitude, then we will not be getting the spiritual nurture that we need. And I think we are, we are spiritually desensitized to, to miss what Jesus is doing or misinterpret what he's doing. Make it a principle etched in stone. If Jesus Christ found it necessary and advantageous to draw aside in solitude to pray, then we must too if we are going to be his followers, growing in Christ's likeness. Secondly, he shows us the necessity of ministry engagement. You see, you can take anything and run it into a ditch. You can withdraw, recognizing the value of withdrawing, but withdraw from engaging the culture. It's, it becomes sort of a monastic life, the, the life of someone living in a monastery. Where they disengage completely. Jesus strikes the balance. As surely as he withdraws for solitude, he also puts himself back in the middle of the situation, engaging in ministry. If there was anyone on the planet who ever deserved to say, I'm tired, <laughs> it was Jesus of Nazareth. If you read the gospel accounts with, with uh, understanding, you get this sense that he could hardly go anywhere where there was not a crowd pressing. These, these folks were not wanting his autograph. They were wanting healing. Hope. It's one thing for a, for a little groupie to hold out a pad and get, get some rock star walking by to sign an autograph. No, not, that's not the crowds he was. He was dealing with crowds who, who heard what he could do, who heard what he had done, who had to at all cost, no matter what, get to him, touch him, Engage him, ask of him, beg of him. They pressed upon him. And yet he went back into them. He went back into them, among them. Every time. Every time. And so he shows us how to strike that balance of, of a place, a time of solitude before him and God and no one else. And yet not getting caught up in the syndrome that, that Peter would when he says on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is great. Man, let's just build three tabernacles and stay here. God said in that episode, you remember? This is my son. Listen to him. Now the Bill Askel paraphrase of that is, you shut up and listen. We don't need your ideas. You need to know what my son is saying. So we have this blessed example from our Savior, which keeps us going. Because when, when, when you're engaged intensely in ministry, sometimes you may, you've known this, you may not know what to call it, uh, compassion fatigue. And you simply want to stop, you want to quit, you it's often at that time that you discover the strengthening of the Lord in your life. Well, let's look at the, this third thing. He shows us when he is near, we need not fear. The, the, the passage is, is, is I want us to look at this real quickly. When they saw him walking on the sea, they, this is verse 49, they thought it was a ghost, so they don't recognize him immediately. I, I guess you could say they didn't expect to see anyone walking on the sea. So to see someone or something walking on the sea, they would make that default conclusion that that's a ghost figure and they cried out they began to scream oh my goodness oh oh no what is that for they all saw him and were terrified but immediately he spoke to them when they heard his voice it was altogether different and said take heart it is I Take heart. I am. I am He. Stop being afraid. We, 
We're told in verse 48, I didn't read this, but it says that he meant to pass them by. And you read that and you go, what, in, what, is, what do you mean you meant to pass them by? He was, he was just going to walk on the water across the sea and meet them at the shore. When you, when you take the three accounts together, you get this impression. That what he's saying is that he meant, he meant to pass by them. In other words, to get, to get ahead of them, to get in front of them. Because they're dealing with a very rough sea. Had he gotten in front of them and then seen themselves rowing to him, it would have changed, uh, would have changed their, their energy, it changed their purpose, changed their resolve. And it seems like what he was doing. But their cry out of fear, being terrified. He, Jesus, notice how in the, in the Gospels he responds to the, to the fearful, he responds to the, hurt, the hurting. His compassion drives him to meet needs. And he's done that in your life and in my life. And so we're told that he said, take heart. It's I, don't, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. And we're told he gets into the boat. Now we're, there's something left out here. We're going we're to come to that in a minute. Well, as soon as he got in the boat, the wind ceased. That should have reminded them of something. He'd been in the boat with them before, asleep in the storm, and woke up, and the storm ceased. They were utterly astounded. And then this is, this is the part of the, of the story that just... For they did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. And I don't know why that is. I mean, the commentators make some speculations. Some, was it because they didn't pay close enough attention as to where, this, where the food was coming from? Even though they're the ones that brought him the lad's lunch? Did they somehow come to despise his miracle power to feed thousands of people because he didn't use that same power to feed them every day? I, I, I tend to go that way. That I think their hearts had hardened over it. They didn't understand why he had miraculously produced a full meal satisfying thousands of people and yet he wouldn't do that for them every day. Brothers and sisters, there's a warning here. When we see Jesus do something wonderful for someone, we dare not become begrudging about that. And when we've been on the receiving end of his goodness and his mercy, we dare not become presumptuous about that. that therefore, therefore, he is sort of the, the heavenly uh, sandwich machine. He's the, he, just pull, pull the lever and what you need is going to pop out every time. There's, we have to guard ourselves against that mentality or we will become, their hearts were hardened. The people who spent day and night with him, their hearts were hardened. We need to guard against that. He's, we need to learn the lesson that when Jesus is near, the nearness of Jesus is, is that which overcomes our fear. And, that, and what's important is that we have Jesus near. Not that, we, not that he gives us everything we want or gives us everything we need, but that he is near to us. When he is near to us, there is no reason to fear. He says so. Take heart. It is I. Do not fear. If we're not careful, we'll lose our way. Difficult providences will stir up fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what's going to happen. And he says to you and he says to me, take heart. Be encouraged. I am here. Stop being afraid. Finally, in just a, for the few minutes we have left, I want us to look at what we can learn from Peter's experience. Just interesting to me, as, as a side note here, Peter telling this, these accounts to Mark, who's writing them down, that Peter did not tell about this part of the story. Now, you know, I don't know why. Was it because he, he didn't want pride to get in the way? Or because he, he didn't like the way it ended? I don't know. We'll leave that to be answered later if it's important enough to answer. The parallel passage in Matthew which we read together beginning verse 28 
Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Fascinating. There were people throughout Jesus' ministry who said, if you are the Son of God, the devil said it to him. The Pharisees will say it to him. If you are, prove it. Jesus, in mercy, determined to give Peter an answer and an opportunity here. Lord, if it's you, command me to come. He says one word, come. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now, that's, that's miraculous. I mean, I can, I can handle Jesus, the Son of God, being able to walk upon water, to be able to steal, steal the, steal the uh, seas and calm the waves and stop the winds. But Peter, a mere man, a man of like passions with us, walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, we, we, may, we may never in our lives be in a boat and called upon to step out onto the waves and walk. But I'll tell you something. You'll be called upon to walk in something difficult. Lord, I want to come to you through this. I want to come to you. I'm here and this, this difficult providence keeps me from you. And Jesus says, come. Come. And what happens is we, we do as, after a fashion physically walk on something more difficult for us to stand on than water. Yet we're told here, when he saw the wind, now this is interesting because you know you can't see the wind. Jesus, Jesus says that in John chapter 3. You can't, you can't see the wind, but you, you see the effect of it. You see things moving. So what we're hearing, when he saw the effect of the wind, that the wind was kicking up the waves, that even though he's walking on the water, get the picture here, his sandals are getting wet, his robe is getting wet, the, the waves are rolling over him. And when, when he sees where he is, He begins to sink. And I promise you, if you've walked with Jesus Christ any length of time at all, you've been there. You've been intently coming to Jesus, following Jesus in a difficult providence, and, and, we, and then we get preoccupied with the difficulty of the providence, and we begin to sink. You will every time. It doesn't mean you walk through life impervious to difficulty. That's not, the, that's not what's being taught here. What's being taught here is that we can step into the most difficult, some, sometimes seemingly impossible providences, and yet in the midst of them fix on Jesus. The Hebrew writer says we, we are to run the race marked out for us, looking unto Jesus. We're to lay aside every besetting sin that, that entangles us, and we're to look to Jesus and walk toward Jesus as he says, come, keep coming. It's sometimes with the new Christian, if you watch them, you ever watch a child learn to walk? It's fascinating. You finally get them to, to stand, and the wobbling is there, but the wobbling doesn't take them down immediately. And, they, and, they, they, and you, see, you see this, it's like a light comes on, and and they take a step. Maybe they fall after that. Maybe they fall while taking the step. But, but you get them back up and they realize, I don't have to live on, scoot around on my knees the rest of my life. And they take a step and then another step. And, and they begin to be amazed. Of course, we're amazed. We're cheering them on. Folks, that's what Jesus Christ is doing. He's saying to you, come on. Come on. And as long as as you're enabled by the Spirit to not let the cares of life distract you and you look to Him, knowing that whatever, whatever you're walking through, wherever it is taking you, it is taking you to Him. And that if indeed you look around you and you will, we always do, that He will be there. Lord, save me. I have you. 
I've got you. And you may get chided about it. That's okay. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Because I'm a frail creature of dust. I've received a great saving mercy from Jesus Christ. And yet, as I deal, struggle with remaining sin, too often I find myself glancing at Jesus and gazing at the providence. And when I gaze at the providence, it's a surefire way to sink. And then worship will come. You see, here's, here's the... I want to try to close with this. It's not just you looking unto Jesus and being enabled by His grace to walk through the providence. And even stumbling and seeing Him lift you up. It's others who are watching you, who see you walking through the difficult, seemingly impossible providence. And they are constrained to worship. When they got into the boat, verse 32, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly, you are the Son of God. You see, when we will train ourselves to look at Jesus, we, we sing a hymn. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness. You see there's light for a look at the Savior. Light more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And life, by the way, life lived here on earth. Life lived in the midst of difficult providences is lived just that way. Back and forth, back and forth. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And, and then we look away. And the things of earth are not strangely dim. The things of earth are, are present in a huge way. And we... We may receive glory, may receive grace, but we don't, we don't get the full effect of it in our lives. As Joshua sang a while ago, you call me out upon the waters. He does that, by the way, to, to you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. He will say, step into it. And whatever that is in our lives, it shouldn't surprise us, though, because he, he prompted Moses... When Moses had, the, had all the children of Israel out of, of their bondage in Egypt, standing on the banks of the Red Sea, he prompted Moses to say to the people, be still and see the salvation or the deliverance of the Lord. And he stepped, I'm convinced of this, those waters parted when Moses took a step into them. You may say, Pastor, the waters are too deep. They're taking me over. You may remember in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress that one of his characters, I think it's, I think it's hopeful, when he gets to the edge of the river to cross the Jordan to the to Beulah Land, the celestial city, they both pass over. The hopeful passes over just in, in terror death terrorizes him. Christian continues to give him encouragement and be of good cheer. He will call us to that. He will call us to die one day. And you pray, what you learn to do as a disciple of Christ is you pray, oh God, help me to live well. May people see my life and 
may become an attraction to them of Jesus Christ. May they see my life and conclude, he really does believe that there is a God. He really does believe that there is a Savior. He, he is really banking everything on him. Help us to live well. Help us to die well. Because Jesus is nearer to you than we can ever imagine. And perhaps we just need to once again say, Lord, how can I, how can I get through this? And hear him say, come, come on. You see, it's interesting, he, had, he put himself in a position where he was ahead of Peter, and Peter had to come to him. But to look unto Jesus, Hebrews tells us, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And we're to run with endurance that is committed to run to the end, the race that has been marked out for us. My race is not your race, your race is not my race, but it is a race that I need to run, and I pray to God I will run well, and I pray that you will run well. To the author that is the one who began, and the finisher who will keep us to the end of our faith. When you read this passage, don't be too critical of Peter when you read the Matthew companion passage. I thank God that Peter came to a point pretty quickly in that episode where he was not content simply to be terrified with the rest very long. But he said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come. I don't want to step anywhere where Jesus hadn't bid me come. <laughs> That's not a safe place. <laughs> bid me come. And then he came. I thank God for that. I thank God for you. Many of you model that for us. You walk by faith daily in difficult providences. And may God teach us that and encourage us that and renew us in that. That if Jesus bids us come, it doesn't matter what we have to walk through. He is there and near we need not fear and he will rescue us when we begin to sink so we leave this place today I want you to know that Jesus Christ is able to overcome our circumstances and lead us to walk where he where we never imagined we could walk I want you to have a feeling of awe at the power of Jesus in us and hope for wherever he may lead us finally I want you to live a life full of hope and share this with others who have no hope, because they're all around us. All other ground is sinking sand. We know the rock, Jesus Christ. Let us show that by how we live and tell that to others that they might live. Let's pray together.